Last is from the prophet Micaiah. This is our text that we've been using for the series, 1 Kings 20, 1 through 14. Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his forces. This is an enemy king coming against the king of Israel. 32 kings were with him with horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria, that's the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, and made war against him. Then he sent messengers into the city to Ahab, king of Israel, and said to him, Thus says Ben-Hadad, and what he's doing here is trying to pick a fight. Your silver and your gold are mine, your loveliest wives and your children are mine. Uh, and it's like a bully coming and saying, hey, I'm going to take your lunch. Yeah. And he says, and the king of Israel answered and said, uh, my Lord, O king, just as you say, I and all that I have are yours. Okay, I'm not going to fight you over my lunch. Then the messengers came back and says, thus speaks Ben-Hadad, saying, indeed, I've sent to you, saying, you shall deliver to me your silver and your gold, your wives and your children, but I will send my servants to you to tomorrow about this time and they'll search your house and the houses of your servants and it shall be that whatever is pleasant in your eyes they will put it in their hands and take it that's like the bully saying okay you're going to give me your lunch now I'm going to go in I'm going to take your brother's lunch your sister's lunch and your friend's lunch I'm going to do that as well all right so the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said notice please and see how this man seeks trouble for he sent to me for my wives, my children, my silver, and my gold, and I didn't deny him. And in other words, I gave him a lunch. And all the elders and all the people said to him, Do not listen or consent, you know, because he's asking too much of you. Therefore he said to the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king, all that you sent for me to do, for your servant to do the first time I will do, but this last thing I cannot do. And the messengers departed and brought back word to the, to the king, and Ben-Hadad sent to him and said, the gods do so to me, and more also, if enough dust is left of Samaria for a handful of each of the people who follow me. And so the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, let not the one who puts on his armor boast like the one who takes it off. And it happened when Ben-Hadad heard this message, and as he and the kings were drinking at the command post, that he said to his servants, Get ready, and they got ready to attack the city. Now, that is the text that we use for the series that we began looking at the prophet Micaiah. Prophet came, told the king, don't bow down, God's with you, and they won the battle. Prophet came back, said to him, they're going to come back next year, get ready, and because uh, God's going to help you to do that as well. They won that battle. Then all of a sudden, you had uh, some other things took place, and the prophet came back again. We've looked at four messages in that particular scenario, and uh, we're going to continue this week. That's the basis for the series, but there's one particular text we're going to read in a minute here, that's going to be the text for today. So we're going to be continuing our study of the life of a prophet named Micaiah. His name means who is like God. We do not know which city he came from. We don't know his age, his history, etc. Unlike some ministers today that want to tell you where they're from and how to give and where to put it, you know, whatever. Sorry, don't know where that came from. We do know that he lived and prophesied in the northern kingdom of Israel during the reign of a King Ahab around the 9th century B.C., that means before Christ. As stated previously, the only place where he's mentioned by name is in 1 Kings 22. That's the text we're going to look at here in a moment. It is in this passage which we will look at, when, which, of which Micaiah is mostly remembered. 400 prophets told Ahab the flattering message he wanted to hear, and Micaiah went to Ahab and said to him, As the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that's what I'm going to say. Not what YouTube wants me to say. Not what Facebook wants me to say. Not what anybody else wants me to say. I'm going to preach what the word of the Lord is. By the way, we got a, we got a strike on YouTube for a message I preached a couple of years ago. Saying I was given false information on the shot. Well, they're behind two years because come to find out there was a lot of false information going on on the shot. By the way, I will remind you, if you did have the shot, that the Lord spoke to me, I think I mentioned it a couple months ago or maybe a year ago, you know, when you get older, everything's a couple of months ago, <laughs> that everybody that was on this boat with me is going to be safe. Amen. So no matter whether you took the shot because you got bad information or you just was trying to do the right thing, it doesn't matter, God is faithful and he will take care of you. By the way, why don't we just do something here? If you had the shot, you worried about it, you felt like you made a mistake, you shouldn't have done it, you kind of worried about the consequences, because, you know, people are not doing so well that have taken the shot. 
And I believe the word of the Lord to me was, everybody on this boat with me is going to be saved. Just like when Paul was in the storm and God said, everybody on the boat is going to come out all right. If you're here and I want to do, I want to do something, I want to, I want to bring feet to that prophetic word. If you're here today and you like prayer over that, you've had the shot, and you just want to make sure that you're going to be safe and everything's going to be okay, if you'll stand up, I want to pray over you, and I believe God's going to touch you today. If you had the shot and you don't really care, that's up to you. But if you had the shot and you say, I want to make sure that nothing bad is going to happen to me because of this shot, then I want to pray for you. There's no guilt. There's no condemnation. Listen, one of the things I realized, we did it. Those of us that did it, I didn't. But those of us that did it, we did it because we trusted the people that were telling us to do it. So you didn't do anything wrong on that level. However, the Lord is merciful. He's graceful. He's just. He's forgiving. And I believe he answers prayer. And so, Lord, all of those that are here today that took the shot, Father God, that are saying, you know, there's some things coming out now that we're seeing. And, and you know, there's these... Uh, uh, I believe you spoke to me, Father God, that everybody that was on this boat with me was going to be saved. They were going to come out of this thing okay. So in the name of Jesus, we just speak life. We reverse any curse. We reverse any damage. And in Jesus' name, we say be made whole. And we thank you, Lord, and we believe your word is true. And everybody said amen. amen. So get ready for a second trike in two years. That's like when you go apply for a disability, you be ready, it's going to be a two years before you get it. <laughs> Not that anybody here is ever going to need it, but uh, I got somebody that's trying to plan for disability, and they're telling me it's going to be at least a year or two. That's just the way the government works. So. Anyway, as the Lord lives, he says, whatever the Lord says to me, that's what I'm going to speak. Here is the mark of a true prophet, preacher, and teacher of the word. He speaks and says what the word of God says. Unintimidated by the messages of the numerous false prophets or the hatred of the pure word of God or the lying media, what does Trump call them? The, the fake news, right? And by the way, if your eyes haven't been opened yet, there is a lot of, people call it conspiracy, but it's not conspiracy anymore. It is a proven propaganda campaign of the media to get you to do what they want you to do. But you don't follow media. The Bible says they that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And you have an opportunity. Listen, I don't, I don't use my pulpit to preach politics. But you can't live in this world without being involved in politics. And I'm here to tell you, my personal belief no matter how you feel, is that Trump is God's man for the hour. He has the anointing of God on his life. He's been set apart by God to be the, the president of this nation. He's not a pastor. He's not a preacher. He is a, 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 a president that God has anointed to lead us into the next era of what we're called to do. And as Christians, if we'll stop fighting and bickering and saying, well, no, he's not acting like a man, like a pastor, he's not acting like this, if we'll stop doing that and we begin to open our eyes to who God is putting his hand on, then we can get together as a community. We have more influence than any other group in this nation. But you know what, the, what happens is the enemy divides us because he wants us divided. The media wants us divided. You know, I don't care what they call me. I know who God says that I am. I am not who anybody else says that I am. You can call me a deplorable if you want, but I'm a child of the living God. You understand what I'm saying? And let's, let's do something significant for our children. Because I will tell you something, if we keep going in the direction that we're going, we're not going to have much of a nation net left. Well, I'm voting for this guy because he's better than this guy. Have you not seen the fruit of the last four years? Are you better off than you were? You're paying $16 for a Big Mac? I 
I remember when I would go and pay four ninety nine for Louis Luann's letter. Yeah. Now I have to pay eight ninety nine plus tax plus tip. I used to be able to go. I used to go to. I used to go to lunch where I could get out with five dollars. Now I go to lunch and, and I'm, I'm hoping to get out with fifteen dollars. But the media hasn't, the media is convincing you that you're better off today than you were before. I'm just trying to tell you, you can change things. This thing about Christians aren't supposed to vote, hey, what rock are you living under? Are you a citizen of the United States of America? You know why people came to this country? They came to this country for hope of a better life. And they came to this country uh, underneath uh, uh, regimes that took away their voice. And we're letting this country as it is and the administration it is right now take away our voice, take away our votes, take away our rights. That's enough. It's not the will of God. Do something. There's a little boy on a beach. I'm going to get back to the world. There's a little boy on the beach. Storm had come in, washed up a whole bunch of starfish. He was taking, I mean, littered with, I mean, you're talking about millions of starfish on the beach. And he was going out, throwing a starfish back in the ocean. Old man comes along and says, son, you're not doing any good. Stop doing it. It ain't going to help anything. But he picks up the starfish and he said, well, it's going to make a difference to this one and he throws it back in. And you know what the fake news and the agenda of the day and the administration of today, they want to make you feel like you don't make a difference and your voice doesn't count. But I'm here to tell you, your voice counts. We're going to look at today one man, one man, everybody around him was telling him, just go with the party line. Just do, play it safe, make everybody happy. And he refused to do that. And I want you to know that I want you to take away from today that you can be this person. You can be this man. You can be this woman. You can be this child. Because the Holy Spirit is not common, pint-sized versions. He, he can pour himself out. All You get all the Holy Spirit, no matter how big you are, how small you are, whether you're man or woman, it doesn't matter. You are an instrument of Almighty God that He wants to use, but He wasn't. He won't make you. David grabbed. He said, "I'll do it," and he ran to the battle. And we need some people today that aren't intimidated by the fire, aren't intimidated by the Egyptians, aren't intimidated by the the, the armies that are coming our way, and say, "With God for us, who can stand against us?" All right, while the Lord does not reveal to us the things we celebrate in people today, right, the Lord does reveal to us what is most important and for which we should all desire to be known. Micaiah was a faithful servant of God. While only mentioned by name in the above passages, it doesn't mean that Micaiah's influence is not felt in other passages. Last week we looked at how Micaiah was sent to inspire the king of Israel to fight in the midst of overwhelming odds. This week we want to look at how the prophet Micaiah was sent, was sent uh, actually, the, that's not what we looked at, that was, that was several weeks ago. But this week we want to finish by looking at how the prophet Micaiah is sent for to be inquired of. He is sent for by the king to be inquired of. The key point for us is that word inquire. Everything in this series has begun with the letter I, to inspire, to instruct, to inform, to indict, and today it's to be inquired of. And the text we're going to be looking at is 1 Kings 22, 3 through 9. The king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead is ours, but we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria? So the king of Syria, same king we were looking at, had some territory that belonged to Israel, and Ahab, the king of Israel, is saying, Hey, that belongs to us. We need to go do something about it. So he said to Jehoshaphat, who is another king, he is the king of the southern kingdom of Israel called Judah. 
he says to him, Will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? Jehovah, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. In other words, I got your back. Also, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire for the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. Sounds pretty good, but you don't know the whole context yet. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? See, what we're going to see here in a minute is those 400 prophets were not prophets of the Lord. They were prophets of the golden calves that had been set up in the northern kingdom. So the, uh, uh, the, so the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man, the guy we've been looking at, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom may, we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him. Because he doesn't prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say such things. Then the king of Israel called, all, called an officer and said, Bring Micaiah, the son of Imlah, quickly. So, uh, first thing we want to look at here is, we, we, under the subtitle, false prophets. The king of Israel had a group of prophets around him who were not real prophets of God. You see, we read the word prophets, we think prophet of God. No, they had prophets of Baal, prophets of Asherah, prophets of the golden calves. They had prophets of all the gods at that particular time. Uh, it's kind of like today, you have prophets, but the world has uh, mediums. They have uh, people that lead, that, uh, what do they call them? Um, huh? Seances, necromancers, you know. All of that stuff is good in the eyes of the world, but it's not in the eyes of God. God has usually one way of doing things, right? The prophets that are anointed by the Spirit of God. The world can access things, but they don't access it the way God wants it to be accessed. And oftentimes what happens is almost every time, if not every time it happens, you open yourself up to a demonic thing. The enemy comes as an angel of light, and you give him opportunity to mess with you in your life. Well, anyway, these 400 prophets were not prophets of God. More than likely, they were appointed to be prophets in the false system of worship created by the first king of Israel by the name of Jeroboam. How did this come about? Well, when King Solomon transgressed the commands of God, see, he was told not to marry many wives, but he married a bunch of them. But that wasn't really the problem. The problem was that he was marrying these wives to make peace with the nations around him and part of the treaty was when he married them, he had to create a place of worship for their God. So he was, he was bringing to the land of Israel uh, idols and temples being built for the wives that he had married as part of a treaty. It looked wise, but sometimes what looks wise is really stupid. All right? So when King Solomon transgressed the commands of God, the Lord took away ten of Israel's twelve tribes from Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and gave them to a man named Jeroboam. Jeroboam, then he thought to himself, wait a minute, that's great. I know God did this for me. God wanted Jeroboam to live right. He would take care of him. But Jeroboam began to think politically. And you know, sometimes even in the church, if we're not careful, we start to think more politically than spiritually. Right? Well, if I say this, what are they going to say? If I say this... What are they going to say? If I start dealing with uh, the sin of homosexuality and transgenderism, if I start dealing with those sins, are we going to create problems? Are people going to leave? Is this going to happen? You've you got to preach the Word of God. You can't live that way, right? So politics can get involved in a lot of different things, but Jeroboam started thinking, because he was a northern kingdom, but the temple of God was in the southern kingdom. And every year, according to the worship of God's word, according to the, the prescription of God's word, every Jew was supposed to go back to Jerusalem three times a year. And he got to thinking, hey, you know what? God gave me this king, these ten king, uh, tribes, but if I let them go back to Jerusalem, they're going to want to unify again. If they unify again, I'm out of a job. So 1 Kings 12, 27 through 29, if this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord of Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king took counsel 
and made two calves of gold. And he said to the people, You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. By the way, these weren't gods. These were idols, false system of worship. And if you were to read the scripture, we won't do it today, he would appoint anybody that wanted to be a priest, he would appoint him to be a priest. And of course, I guess the same thing happened with being a prophet. So throughout history, it was customary to seek the counsel of the national deity for his word before going to war. Prophets of Baal, if your system is Baal worship, what do the prophets say? Should we go? Are we going to be successful? Do we need to offer sacrifices? That's the way the world does it. But the Word, the word of God teaches that when Israel uh, was in, in the middle of having to make a decision, should we go to war or not, David said, let's inquire of God. And God would say, I'm with you, go, or not right now. So it, there was, it was a common practice. So Ahab had all sorts of prophets at his, at his disposal, and they were uncritically loyal to the king of Israel because he fed them. He gave them a stipend. He gave them tax-exempt status. Probably got to eat from the king's food. So why would they want to do anything that not just get them out of the king's graces, but could also send them to the lion's den? So all these prophets prophesied what the king wanted to hear. Yeah, go. You're going to have a victory. The real underlying issue was whether or not these men had a word from God. That's where we get Micaiah, second point, God's prophet. King Jehoshaphat, who is from the southern kingdom of Israel, who uh, 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 called Judah, they have the temple there. He is a true man of God, living for God. He's unconvinced by these prophets, and he asks for another opinion. His stance was to seek God's word as opposed to Ahab, who was seeking support. You know, sometimes let's just be honest as people we'll go around asking advice whether we should do something or not but we're really not interested in advice what we're really interested in is somebody to agree with us because we already know what we want to do people don't come and ask me for marital advice anymore they used to come and ask me all the time but I think word got out because if people were going to get married and, and I would ask them are you a Christian? yes is the other person a Christian? well they're Catholic they used to go to church a long time ago. Uh, this is what the Word of God says. If, you, if you're not both uh, uh, Christians, you're unequally yoked. Are you living together? God won't bless a marriage where you guys are living together and having sex before you're married. Are you living together? Well, well, I said, well, if you'll stop and refuse to do that, then I will marry you, but you're going to have to abstain for a while. But if you refuse to do that, I'm not going to do that. Uh, uh, See, I didn't give them what they wanted to hear. But a lot of people today want to hear that, oh, God understands. Yeah, he understands. It's called sin, and you're practicing sin. Right? Well, everybody has needs. Everybody has needs. But we don't legitimize somebody going out and stealing from a store and robbing a bank because they have a need. They need money. We say that's wrong. Well, they have a need. Yeah, but the need doesn't legitimize sinfulness. Right? And we have to learn how to believe God to do things His way. And His way is, is sexuality a need? Yes, it is. But His way is between a man and a woman that are married in covenant to one another. Oops, am I, am I stepping on some toes here? Nobody here. Somebody out there in television land, right? So anyway... Ahab has only one man left in this whole northern kingdom that speaks the truth. And the king whines that this man never says anything good about him. So he is summoned, and the king waits for Micaiah to be brought. 1 Kings 22, 7 through 9. Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here another prophet of the Lord whom we may inquire? And the king said, There's one man by the name of Micaiah. Bring quickly Micaiah, the son of Imlah. Let's be clear. It's not that Micaiah never prophesies good concerning the king, but that the king's desires were not in keeping with God's. See, a lot of people think that God is not good because God won't let them do whatever they want. No, God is good. It's just that his word is true. Let God be true and every man alive. His word is forever settled in the heavens. 
There is, a, there is a faction of Christianity today that is taking the approach that the Word of God is evolving. What was written in the past was written to cultures back then, but people are evolving, and the Word of God has to evolve with culture, with what we know scientifically. That's, you know what they call that in Greek terms? Hogwash. That's a Greek word, hogwash. I learned it in Bible school. That is what you call fake news. The Word of God does not change. It is the same as God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We are not evolving. We are actually devolving. We're not getting closer to God. We're falling away from God. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are, we are becoming less than what we were created as in the beginning. For we were created in the image and the likeness of God. But you look at some people today, and you wonder, what are they imaging? They look more like animals than they do God. Because of their behavior and the way they behave, and the way they treat other people, the way they live. It's, animals live better than that. Boy, strike three. Okay. Okay. What? Yeah, it was about 10 minutes ago. Yeah, that's right. Rumble, I hear a rumble coming. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, the king of Israel was used to having people sanction whatever he wanted to do. But since God was the true king, Micaiah was not sent to sanction what the king wanted, but to reveal what God wanted. Unfortunately, the king of Israel interpreted this as not prophesying good concerning him. You don't like me. You don't want anything good for me. Why? Because I told you not to do that because it's not, not good for you? First, third point we're going to look at. God gives to those who ask in faith. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. A 7, I guess this is 7 and 7. Ask and it will give, be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Over and over the Bible tells us that to ask God for provision, for wisdom, and he has promised to answer. However, the caveat is that we need to ask in faith. Hebrews 11 and 6, it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him or seek his wisdom, seek his ways, seek his way of doing things. To ask in faith is to be committed to doing what God reveals to you regardless of whether it matches your wants or your reasonings. There are many times when you go to the Word of God and it doesn't match what you want. It doesn't let you do what you want to do. But if you're committed to do God's Word and you're committed to follow after God, you don't just do the things that you want to and the things that are easy. The Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. And by the way, I was talking with somebody yesterday just about this very thing. That word narrow means there are restraints. If you're going to be a Christian, you're going to have to learn how to live with restraints. If you want to have a job, you live with restraints all the time. You have to be there at 7.30. Ah, I don't want to be there. Ah, eh. Alarm goes off, though. You're there at 7.30. You know why? Because if you're not there at 7.30, you're going to get fired. You know what that's called? A narrow way. And when you go to work, you actually have to do what they tell you to do. If you're a plumber and you get hired to be a construction uh, person, if they tell you to put your toilet in the bathroom, you may not like it because nobody can see your work. Nobody praises the toilet when it's working good. They only get mad at it when it's not. And if you decide to yourself, well, you know what? People need to see what a good job. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to put the toilet right in the middle of the living room. You're doing what you want, but how long are you going to have a job? Not very long. If you're in the military and they tell you, this is what we need you to do, and you say, well, I think that's not the right thing to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. You know where you're going to end up? You're going to end up in the brig because you're not doing what they tell you to do. Listen, as much as we don't like it, there, are, there is authority called police officers. And I don't like it when the police pull me over. Have they ever pulled you over? Yeah. 
usually for something stupid, I, I, I turned in the second lane instead of the first lane. I'm like, what? Come on. But he's got a badge, and he's got a gun. <laughs> and I say, I'm sorry, officer. What did I do? <laughs> but if you start fighting with him, and you don't learn how to yield to him and submit to what he's telling you to do, you're going to face the consequences of not following the narrow way. And you're going to end up in jail because you turned into a far lane. Christianity is a narrow way. God has determined for us as people what is best for us, for us to be able to get what we want, which is to live an overcoming, victorious kingdom life. But in order to live an overcoming, victorious kingdom life, you have to do it His way. Jesus is the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except through me. By the way, you, if you're a part of the Latter-day Saints, I just want to tell you that you're involved in a cult. And I'll tell you that because you're not going to get to heaven. You will not get to heaven unless you embrace God's Word. And I don't want anybody to leave here today. I'm not against anybody. I don't hate anybody. I'm just here to tell you, you can't get to heaven one day and say, somebody never told me. You have to serve God His way, the way He revealed, not the way another angel revealed or somebody else because there are angels of light. The enemy comes as an angel of light and will give you a false way. You have to do it His way. James 1, 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. What does that mean? It means that when you ask God in faith, you don't just ask for his advice and determine whether you're going to do what he says after he reveals it to you. You ask with the idea that God knows best, and when he reveals something to me, that's what I'm going to do. You understand what I'm saying? All right. In the book of Jeremiah, the leaders of the people came to him to determine what they should do. They committed themselves to do whatever God showed them. However, when it came down to it, like King Ahab in our text, what they really wanted God to do is simply rubber stamp their decisions. Jeremiah 42, 1 through 5, and we'll just jump down here. I'll have the verses up there. It says, Then all the commanders came near and said to Jeremiah the prophet, Pray to the Lord your God for us, that the Lord your God may show us the way we should go and the thing that we should do. And Jeremiah said in verse 5, he said, May the Lord be a true and faithful witness against, they said to Jeremiah, May the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us if we do not act according to all the word with which the Lord your God sends to us. Verse 19, The Lord has said to you, uh, because here's what happened. Let me give you the context. Jeremiah went and prayed. It took 10 days for God to answer him. I don't think God needed 10 days. I think that God waited 10 days so that what the people really wanted to do would come out. Right? And sometimes if we can't wait on God, we're going to do what we want. Right? Well, God didn't answer me, so I'm just going to do what I want. And God waits sometimes to see what you're going to do. Are you really committed to doing things his way, or you want to do it your way? So he came back 10 days later, and Jeremiah said, don't go to Egypt, because that's what they were asking. Should we stay in the land, or should we go to Egypt? We'll do whatever God tells us to do. Jeremiah comes back and says, don't go to Egypt. And they said, ah, you're a liar. God didn't send you to tell us that. We're supposed to go. We're going to Egypt. And not only were they going to Egypt, they took Jeremiah with them. And Jeremiah says, the Lord has said to you, O remnant of Judah, do not go to Egypt. Know for a certainty that I have warned you this day that you have gone astray at the cost of your life. Unlike King Ahab, Scripture testifies of King David as a man after God's own heart. The reason he is called so is because he was determined to find God's will for his life and equally determined to do whatever the Lord revealed for him to do. Even when the situation seemed obvious, David continues to show forth his resolution to doing God's will by inquiring of God and doing what God said. Acts 13.22 says, When he had removed him, 
talking about King Saul. He raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. Now let's, let's just be clear here. So when we come to church and we're worshiping God with all our heart, we say there's a person that has all God's heart. But then when they leave here and they don't do what God says, is it really a person that has all God's heart? Is it really a person whose desire is to serve God with all their heart? No. Because a person that desires to serve God with all their heart doesn't just worship God when things are, are going good, doesn't just do things when they want to. They do God's will no matter what. Whether it's popular or whether it's not. Reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They had a statue that was built. The king says, I want everybody to fall down and worship this statue. If you don't fall down and worship this statue, you're going to get thrown into the fire. Well, everybody's kind of like, well, I guess we're going to be worshiping a different statue today. Problem was, there was a lot of Jews in the audience as well. And I want you to know that there were only three that refused to bow down. Jews, I want to tell you something, there was a lot more Jews that were there. But you know what they did? They bowed down. And they probably thought to themselves, well, I'm not going to worship the statue, but I'm going to tie my shoes at the appropriate time. And when I tie my shoes at the appropriate time, I'm not worshiping the statue, but at least I'm not going to get thrown in the fire. And they had a lot of good reasons for not getting thrown in the fire. One is, I probably hurts. Two is, who's going to pay to take care of my family? How am I going to do this? I mean, those are all legitimate reasons, but they're not right. Right? Jesus said, he that would deny himself, must, he that would come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, King, we're not, we believe that God will rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we've already decided, we're not bowing down to your idol. You know what the king did? He got mad. He sent the DOJ and the FBI against him. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he held up their background check. So, uh, he did all these things. Swap team showed up on the next morning, you know. Whatever. They said, we ain't bound down. Well, we're going to throw you in jail unless you say what we want you to say. You're going to be in there like January 6th for years, and there's nothing you can do about it. Huh? Oh, strike number nine. The gloves are off. Well, well, thank you. <laughs> we want another prophet to come and talk to us. Yeah, we don't like this one. Not that I'm a prophet. But anyway, um, they said, no, we're not going to bow down. And so you know what happened? What the king said was going to happen. Made the fire hotter. He said, we're going to give you one more chance. Maybe you didn't hear what we said. It's going to be bad. You're not just going to die. You're going to die worse. How can you die worse? If I was going to get thrown in the fire, man, heat it up ten times. At least it's going to go faster, you know, I'll incinerate before I feel it. Well, anyway, I said, you're going to go in there. And they said, we're not going to do it. And they threw him in the fire. And when they threw him in the fire, pretty much expected they were going to be incinerated. Well, the people that threw him in the fire got incinerated. But the king, he must have had a peephole somewhere because he went and looked. He said, didn't we throw three people in the fire? He said, I'm looking around there there's four and one looks like a son of a god you know sometimes god doesn't reveal himself until you're going through a fire he's always there but you have to trust that he's there but sometimes when you go into the fire that's what reveals him and he said pull him out <laughs> isn't that an incredible thing pull him out we can't kill him pull him out so they pulled him out not only did were they not burned up they didn't smell like smoke. I barbecued some stuff yesterday, and I smelled like smoke. They didn't, their, their hair wasn't singed, nothing. They were perfected. You know, and you know what happened? The king and everybody else realized that their God was truly God. And now the Israelites, they didn't have to bow. Those three Jews didn't have to bow down uh, to this false idol, but everybody else had to recognize the God of these three children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How do I get up on that? Oh, you're going to do the will of God no matter what. So uh, 
we see this quality revealed in how David reacted uh, uh, to the invasion of the Philistines. I'm running along, so I'm not going to really talk about that. Well, anyway, when uh, there was another situation where David's family was taken from him, David uh, was on the run from King Saul. I just want you to know that sometimes when you're serving God, things don't always go good. Right? I was afraid about this. You know, I, I, not that I know that I did anything wrong, and all of a sudden I had an episode with my back. Why did that happen? I don't know. I have the same questions like you. Why? But I, I've learned enough to go on in life, not to say, well, God, I can't believe you let this. I don't, I don't do that. I said, you know what? I'm going to use this as an opportunity to worship God. Because the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always, not just when things are going good. Is God faithful only when things go good? Is God faithful only when you experience the goodness of God? No, he's faithful all the time. We don't know why, but the scripture that came to me was, uh, no weapon formed against you shall, no tongue that is raised shall stand. And the thought that I had, you know, with these, what do you call it, election interference trials that are happening right now, strike 10. Uh, you know what, there's no guarantee that you're not going to get sued, that people aren't going to say things against you, that you're not going to uh, uh, have something come against your way. That's not what the scripture means. It doesn't mean that no weapon is ever going to come near you or nobody's going to say anything bad about you because sometimes that's what we read. It means that when the dust settles, it's not going to take you down. You're going you're gonna to be in an overcoming situation. You're going to get past this, and you're going you're gonna to come on top. If it, if it means going through a trial, going through an appeal, going through whatever. But in the end, you're going to come out on top. That's what it means for us. We do have to fight. We do have to fight the good fight of faith. We do go through difficulties. But we got to fight in this way by not taking our eyes off God and by not uh, uh, denying the goodness and the faithfulness of God through the struggles that we go through. Amen. Amen. David was on the run. And his, his, he and his men were doing something that probably his men thought they shouldn't have done. They were going to go help the Philistines in battle. They got denied. While they were out there, uh, an enemy came and overran the city where they were living in, took all their children, took all their goods, took everything. And David is surrounded by all these men who are weeping. He lost everything. They lost everything. You ever been in a place where you felt like you lost everything? They were there. And they, they were upset. And they not only wanted to, to quit, they wanted to kill David. David's the one that had been leading them in all these victories. David probably wanted to kill David. <laughs> you, ever, you, ever, you ever had regrets for the decisions you made? You know, once you've done it, there's nothing you can do. You can't go back and change the past. So what do you do? David said, well, I probably shouldn't have made that decision. It doesn't say that in the Bible. It's just Rick, Rick translation. And he, he, the, but the Bible says he inquired of God. He, he Actually, let's see what it says. Uh, David strengthened himself in the Lord. And David called to the priest, Abiathar, bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought the ephod, and David inquired of God, shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? And he said, yes, pursue, for you shall surely overtake, and he, you shall surely rescue. Another translation says, and you will recover all. You see what I'm saying? When you're going through difficulties, don't turn your eyes off God. Ask the Lord how not what you're going through now, but how is this going to end up and what do I need to do? I know that in the end, I'm going to recover all. I know that in the end, it's going to all work out for good. But what I need to do right now is I need to find out the will of God and whatever he tells me to do, that's what I'm going to do. Sometimes the last thing you want to do when you've been defeated is go fight. But if God says go fight... You strap on your armor and you fight. Of the last page of the whole series. You're not done. What we see happening with David is what every king of Israel was supposed to do. They were supposed to seek God's counsel and do what God said. In our text, King Ahab was forced to seek God's will. He hesitantly sent for the prophet Micaiah. But instead of bowing to the will of God, he ignored it. And here's the problem, major problem, that we need to reflect on. It ended up costing him the battle, but it also cost him his life. There are some decisions that we make that can cause great harm to us if we choose not to do God's will. 
but we also need to be aware of the fact that some decisions that we make can not only bring harm to our life, but they can actually cause destruction in our life. So I'm really, really encouraging us as a body to make a decision that whatever God reveals to me, whether I like it or not, whether it's easy or not, I'm going to do God's will for my life. And what is the will of God? Is it what the preacher says? No, it's what the Word of God says. So in conclusion, today we focus on King Ahab's unwillingness. We got food for you. <laughs> to heed the word of God as it came to him through the prophet Micaiah. I do not want to finish this message without also acknowledging the boldness and the courage of Micaiah to declare the word in the midst of such a contrary situation. Although faced with opposition and certain dire consequences for speaking the truth of God's word, he did not acquiesce. He is a shining example to all who aspire to proclaim God's word. You want to preach God's word? You better have a call on your life. If you have a call on your life and you're determined to follow after God's will, preach his word. Don't preach what the world wants to preach. Don't bow down because I want to tell you something. God's word is a standard and it is a light and the darkness will always seek to snuff out the light. But I'm here to tell you that the light always overcomes darkness as long as you will manifest the light. You are the light of the world, a city shining on a hill. Arise and shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Micaiah is a model of what it, what it truly means to be a faithful herald, preacher, and prophet of God. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul counseled Timothy as he faced mounting pressure and opposition and imminent death. Paul himself was facing prison and death for his proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Instead of, instead of uh, bowing down to that pressure, he writes to Timothy saying, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, when it's favorable and when it's not. And I want you to know, as bad as things are right now, it's not Canada. If you preach the word in Canada and you're probably going to jail for a long time. Are you going to preach the word? Or are you going to bow down to the pressure? I, I, I was talking with Paul the other day. I said, look, you, you don't want to go to jail because I said, if, if that's what it means, then I'm going to preach the word of God. He's right. I don't want to go to jail. I, it's, not, it's not my plan for my life, and I don't believe it's God's plan for my life. But at some point, we have to be willing to take a stand. We have to be willing to say, this is God's word, and I'm not backing off, whatever the consequences may be. And there are consequences to preaching the word of God. It's not like this here, but in some congregations, you preach the word of God, and you won't have a job tomorrow. You get locked out of the church. So what are you going to do? Are you going to preach what the people want to hear? That's what Paul is writing to Timothy. He said, preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. Go, go. Anybody out there doing that? They will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Amen. And I want you to know that whatever, wherever you're at, whatever God is revealing to you, if it's just to, to live an overcoming Christian life, you're going to have to make a decision. Am I going to do God's will or not? If you're called to preach the word, you're going to have to make a decision. And I'm going to preach what he said or not. It's really that simple. But in order to do God's will, you're going to have to, to die to your own. In order to live, how many of y'all want to be a victorious Christian? There's one word you've got to learn, submit. Submit to you, pastor? Not really. Submit to this. Right? But this word will teach you to submit to those who have charge over you. But it's submit. Well, I don't want to do that. You don't have to. But you're going to struggle in life. Right? The Word of God says you got to forgive. Well, I ain't forgiving nobody. You don't know what they did. You don't know what they said to me. But I'm not the one that said to forgive. 
the Word of God said to forgive. What you're really saying is that you don't have to forgive because you're special. You don't have to forgive because you are more uh, uh, have more uh, authority than God does. That's what you're really saying. Now, if you don't want to forgive, you don't have to. But if you want to experience God's grace and provision and blessing and bounty on your life, you have to submit. Forgive those who have hurt you. How often do I need to forgive them? Seven times? No. Seventy times seven. Well, you don't know what they did, but God does, and he's the one that said to forgive. Mm -hmm.